I hope you have been able to read through Second Peter. We are finishing our series on escaping corruption. I showed these last week, and several of you have taken advantage of them. These are tassels that I made for prizes for those who memorize the seven things we are to add to our faith. So if you've done that, and you can come up and say them to me after the, after the service, I can give you a tassel. This is from Numbers 15, 37 to 40, which says, make tassels on your clothing so you'll remember to do the things I've told you to do, and you won't be distracted by looking at something else. So that's just a little prize for those who've made every effort to add to their faith. Have you noticed that the world is lost in corruption? Corruption is growing. It's multiplying like rot. It's rotten. Podridão, we say in Portuguese. Paul says, slavery to decay. The creation has been submitted to slavery to decay. We're going into a a dangerous message this morning. I've chosen the, the title of Spotless, Blameless, and at Peace with God. And Peter says one more time, make every effort. But I need to say to you that this message is for those who have received faith that causes them to be born again by His Spirit, and they are now new creatures in Christ on their way to heaven, and nothing can take that away from them, not even their own sin. Because if you're not born again, and you think you can be spotless, blameless, and at peace with God by your own effort, you are fooling yourself, and what we will read in this passage, you're distorting the Scripture to your own destruction. So my friend, I hope this morning you have been given faith to believe that all you do to be saved is say yes to Jesus and repent of your sin, making him the Lord of your life because of what he has done on the cross. That makes you a new creature, saved by grace, receiving, saving faith. Let's read this short passage of 2 Peter 3, 14 to 16. And I'd like you to follow along in your Bible because I'll be going through it phrase by phrase. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, now we need to stop and think about the context. Peter has just said, judgment is coming. The world will be burned up. The heavens will disappear in a roar. All the things that are done on earth will be shown, will be laid bare. Everything we've done will be seen for what it is. Fiery judgment is coming. The next time Jesus comes, he will not come as a baby, humble and riding on a donkey. He will come in fire and great glory with powerful angels from whom no one will escape. That's what Peter's reminding people of. But for those who are in him, there's the hope of a new earth and a new heaven and rewards for those things that we have done while we are here. That's what he's reminding them of. So he says, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found by Jesus, spotless, blameless, and at peace with him, bearing in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you, with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures, to their own destruction. If you go up to verse 2 of 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter's telling us that he's reminding us of the predictions of the prophets and the command of the Lord Jesus through the apostles. That's this right here. Peter's saying the the prophets predicted that Jesus would come once. They're predicting he will come again. And the apostles, I and Paul and the others, have given you the New Testament, which contains the command of Christ. Now, he doesn't tell us what that command is, but most likely, almost without a doubt, he means Jesus' new commandment and the Great Commission, which I think are easily married. Love one another with all your, with, as the Lord has loved you, as Christ loves you, and go and make disciples of all nations. We don't obey the second because we don't obey the first. If we loved one another, we would make disciples. He's basically saying you will be sanctified by reading the Old Testament and the New Testament, 
in order to stimulate wholesome thinking, that's verse 1, and godly living, that's verse 11. So let's go through this verse by verse. So then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, it's talking about that new earth, the new heaven, where righteousness dwells. So we start living now like we will live then. If we think correctly about the future, we will live righteously in the present. And so that's why I had you ask at the beginning, what are you looking forward to? What you're looking forward to helps you do what's most important today according to that future. Most of us are looking forward to the weekend or a holiday or uh, perhaps our wedding, some birthday, something like that. But beyond all those things is the wedding supper of the Lamb and what Peter is motivating his listeners, including us, to do. You know, they say that societies with harsh winters are more prosperous. Have you heard that? So, uh, uh, the studious have looked at societies that have long, harsh winters, and they tend to be more prosperous generally as a society because there's a motivation to work. Where my uh, mother-in-law lives in Wheaton, Illinois, the winter lasts for six months. Once we counted 60 days straight that the temperature never went above zero centigrade. 60 days and night freezing. Well, when you know that's coming, you get out there and plow and plant and work to create enough prosperity and food to last through those six months of winter. Peter's saying judgment is coming. Fire is coming. Work while it's day. Echoing that verse 1, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. So he says, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to be found, three things, spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. To be found by whom? By Jesus. Do you picture yourself meeting the Lord Jesus? Do you, do you look forward to that? Sometimes I even try to imagine what he will smell like. Jesus has a body. He will look in each one of our eyes who are saved and he will say, hopefully, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we want. And when I think of him meeting me, hugging me as my friend, that motivates me to be found by him, spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. You know, make every effort is repeated four times through this book. It's only eight times in all of the epistles. Verse 5 of chapter 1, verse 10, verse 15, and he's echoing that now. Make every effort. Make every effort to add to your faith. Now make every effort to be found by Jesus, remembering that he's coming spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. My grandmother used to say, what if Jesus comes back and he finds you in a movie theater? She didn't believe going to movies was anything Christians should be doing. I don't believe that. I think you can choose a good movie. The Lord goes along with you. But I do believe that if you think like my grandmother thought, you will change the way you live. What if he comes back and you're looking at pornography? What if he comes back and you're in the middle of a juicy story about somebody else that you shouldn't be telling behind their back? What if he comes back and you're being lazy or proud or selfish? All of those things should be motivating us to move toward holiness with every amount of energy that he gives us because he's coming and we want to be found by him being faithful. The, the gospel says standing at the door, waiting to open the door for him when he gets here. Spotless, blameless, and at peace with God. At first sight, these things look like holiness. Live a right life so that Jesus will reward you when he comes and be happy to see you. As I studied them and looked at the Greek words for, the, for each one, it helped me to see the separation between these things, and I think it will nourish your faith. Spotless is talking about purity. So spotless means not tainted by the world's corruption and filth, washed in the blood. It means not sinning. It's somewhat focused on the past. 
Those things that you have done in the past are spotted with your own sinful intentions, your pride, your self-absorption. And as we come each, each Sunday, we have a time of confessing, Lord, forgive me for this week's rebellion against your word. Forgive me for my sinfulness. That washes those spots away. It's kind of like Peter when he said, Lord, don't wash my feet, wash my whole body. And what did Jesus say? He said, if you've had a bath, that means if you're saved by grace, all you need is for the daily sins of going around in the world in a, in a fleshly mind and eyes and heart. Those things need to be washed, constantly cleansed by his blood. You know, when I was five, I had a three-year-old brother and a one-year-old sister, and we lived in the jungle on a missionary base in Colombia, South America. My mom thought that was fine. No more kids. My dad wanted a big family. Could we please just have one more? And mom said yes. And a year later, they had triplets. <laughs> yes, we are six children still to this day within five years of age of each other. It's a great volleyball team. Three boys, three girls. Well, the triplets were named, of all things, Larry, Lori, and Larry. One year on April Fool's, that's Dia da Mentira in Portuguese, April Fool's Day, we, my brothers and I had this silly idea to color the water tanks. So at our, water, our, our, our missionary base, there were three large water tanks on the tallest hills, and we had my dad buy us three little... Uh, canisters of industrial strength food coloring, powder form, red, green, and blue. We each went five in the morning on April Fool's Day to one water tank with a different color. For some reason, we sent little Larry, who's the youngest, the farthest away. He, he poured the, th there was a little hole at the top of each water tank where you could stick a stick down in to measure the, the water height. So we took that top off and, you know, we're each there in the dark pouring our little food coloring down and Larry spilt some so he picked it up with his hands and moved it over to the, to the hole and then he noticed, oh no, I've blue on my hands. So he finished and he threw the evidence away and he's walking home and he sees a motorcycle coming. Somebody's coming toward him with the light shining. And so he says, what? so he puts his hands behind his back and he smiles as he's walking along at 5.30 in the morning down the road and gets home and said, boy, I think somebody might have saw me out there. And he smiled big and we looked at him and he had wiped his mouth with his blue hand and there was blue all over his face. Now, I don't know who that person was. They never revealed it. I don't think they saw that there was blue on Larry's face. But what an example of our sin. You can't escape it. You know what? Other people notice. When they look at you, they can see, I don't know about this guy. I think he's lying. He's kind of proud. Or she sure is gossipy. Or how come that person never comes to help? They're a little lazy. They can see it. Other people see it. We can't. We think we're hiding. So Peter is saying... Make every effort to wash yourselves in the blood of Christ's gracious sacrifice, even as a saved person, so that you can be found by him without the stain of your own self-absorption all over your face. Revelation 7, 14 says, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation, talking about the 144,000, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. What a beautiful picture of dipping their robes in this red blood and pulling them out pure and clean. What are those robes? What do they represent? Well, Revelation 19 verse 8 tells us that they represent, the, it says, fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's people. Our dress at the wedding supper of the Lamb, will be the righteous acts that we do here while we wait for His appearing. But those acts are always tainted, always spotted with our pride, with our selfishness, with our wrong motivations. And so we need to go and ask mercy for Jesus over our actions, over our lives, and say, I want to wash my life in the blood of the Lamb. Blameless means obedient. Blameless means you're not to blame because you did everything you could. 
Blameless is more focused on the things that you will do in the future. It's about obeying. Have I done everything he commanded me to do? I am tempted constantly to think I'm okay if I haven't done anything wrong. Are you tempted that way too? I don't think I sinned today. The problem is, I don't measure the things that I have left undone. Have I loved with all my heart? Have I loved God with all my heart? Have I loved my neighbor as myself? Have I loved you as Jesus loves you? No, I haven't. And so blameless means I've got to make every effort to obey so that when my neighbor gets to the judgment and says, I didn't know, it won't be my fault that they didn't know because I told them. We are commanded to love. We are commanded to constant prayer. We are commanded to witness and discipleship and reaching the nations. And I find myself every single day wasting precious time of God's patience. Not doing bad stuff, maybe, but just doing silly stuff. So that little brother Larry, with his two sisters, Laurie and Lori, was the good one. Larry was the good one. He was older. He was trying all the time to obey the the rules. He is to this day. He's been a missionary in Honduras for as long as I've been one in Brazil. I call him my big little brother. He's a mentor for me. Faithful to the Lord. Wants to do what's right every time. Well, they would walk together about 10 minutes to a preschool on the missionary base. They'd all walk together before they were in kindergarten. So this was when they were like four. And the rule was, walk straight to preschool, don't go anywhere else, don't stop and play in the ditch, don't walk on the neighbor's wall, go to preschool. And mom thought they'd keep each other accountable. Well, they didn't know that Lori was squirrely. And she would tempt Lori to walk on the neighbor's wall almost every morning. Hey, let's walk on the wall. Nobody's looking. And Larry would say, we're not supposed to walk on the wall. And off he would go, walking down the road like a good boy. Well, one morning, he was almost to preschool, and the girls came zooming by on Aunt Dorothy's motorcycle. She had come by and seen them on the wall and said, hey, you guys want to ride to preschool? And they said, bye, Larry! And they were zooming off to preschool on the back of this motorcycle while Larry kept trudging along as he was supposed to. Guess who got spanked that afternoon after Aunt Dorothy told Mom what the girls were doing? They were to blame, even though they got there first. That's such a good example of sticking to what you know you're supposed to do, even though it looks like everybody that's taking the shortcut is getting there first. And Peter's saying, if you look forward to that judgment at the end, you won't waste that time. You will be blameless. Make every effort to be blameless. Look back at 2 Peter 1, 13 to 15, if you have your Bible, or I'll just read it for you here. Therefore, with minds that are alert, fully sober, Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. The Bible says you will not see God without holiness. Holiness is spotless and blameless. Make every effort to be blameless. Do all that you're supposed to do. Don't do what keeps you from fulfilling God's purpose in your life. And then finally, Peter says, make every effort to be at peace with him. Now this is speaking of intimacy. So you can be a Pharisee and be spotless and blameless, but not know the Lord or not maintain a conversation. How is your conversation with Jesus? Reminded me of coming home and wanting a a big hug and a kiss when I walked in the door. But all day long, Susanna's been sending me texts about different things, and I've been too busy or thinking, oh, I'll see her at the end of the day, and I'll answer that question. And I walk in the door, and guess who's not ready to give me the hug that I was expecting? Doesn't make me not her husband, but we're not at peace. And rightly so, because my conversation hasn't been actualizado, hasn't been up to date, hasn't been constant. At peace with him when he comes is, hey, I know you. We've been chatting. We've been talking. You've been cooperating with my mission and my purpose. Welcome home. 
that's how I want Jesus to receive me. And I've got to make every effort to keep that conversation going, to listen and respond and obey when he talks to me. That peace with God is focused on the present. You know, half of those make every efforts are about peace. Besides this one, there's Romans 14, 9. Make every effort to do what leads to peace. Ephesians 4, 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Hebrews 12, 14. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It takes effort to walk in peace with Jesus. And all of us who are born again know that lack of peace when we sin, when he convicts us of our sin. Suddenly you're like, oh no, I've offended the one who loves me most. And that prayer life becomes stale or even silent. Jesus doesn't leave you, but he recoils in the corner of your heart to keep from being dirtied by your selfishness. So spots are focused on the past. Thoughts Words and actions tainted with my own sin. Blamelessness is focused on doing what Christ has asked me to do so that tomorrow I will obey. I will do what he's asked me to do with every effort that he gives me. And peace with God is focused on the present. Today, now, I will listen and obey the good shepherd's voice. I hope that's as meaningful to you as it is to me. The writer of Hebrews calls this striving to enter his rest. What a great oxymoron. Strive to rest. Work with every effort in your soul to maintain the peace of the Spirit in your heart by covering past actions with his blood and by committing to do all that you is in your power to obey what God has told you in the future. This is what Romans 5, 1 and 2 is talking about. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we boast or look forward to the hope of the glory of God. You see, peace is not passivity. Peace is not passivity. The other day I asked an Uber driver, do you have peace in your heart? That was my opening line for the gospel. I was hoping he'd say no. He said, yeah, I'm fine. And by his manner and the music he was listening to, I could tell, it's the peace of death. See, a dead body has peace, perfect peace. Not worried about a thing. He doesn't feel the danger of God's holy wrath that is hanging over his head. Every minute that goes by gets closer to that judgment and he has not been given grace to be afraid and run to the open door of Jesus where he will be safe from the fire. That's the peace I want. Peace in the ark when the rain is falling on the, on the roof. Peace is more than passivity. There's a difference between peace with God and the peace of death. Those who are called by His glory and goodness know the danger of sin in His holy presence. See, we rest while we run. We can rest and run at the same time. One last example about my mentor, big, brother, big little brother. I call Larry my big little brother. He's five years younger than I am, but I learned so much from him. He's a marathoner. He can run 40 kilometers in three hours. That means about six minutes for every mile. And as I watch him run, I see rest and running at the same time. He's smiling. He's waving to people as he runs by. He used to run down the mountain that he lives on, 18 kilometers, and he knew that if he went back straight up the mountain, it would be only 36, so he needed four more kilometers. So he'd run around town and visit his friends as he ran by. Hey, how you doing? And he'd just keep running. How does he do it? He strives to enter God's rest. That doesn't mean stop running. It doesn't mean go to the beach and lie on the beach. No, no, now and then we rest on the beach too. 
But in Christ, we are fixing our eyes on him, seated at the right hand of the Father, knowing that we are saved, but running the race laid out before us with peace, with joy, with blamelessness and spotlessness because we are looking forward to his blessed appearance. Now we need to finish up. But Peter says, uh, God's patience is salvation. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Back to verse 9, uh, in this same chapter, he says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise. As some understand slowness, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. We deserve destruction, but God's kindness is meant to lead us to repenting. He hasn't come yet. There's still time. There's still time to be spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. So an interesting paragraph is the part about Paul. Peter calls Paul his dear friend, our dear brother Paul. In all his writings, he mentions these things. He's talking about Paul's eschatology, Paul's mentioning of Jesus coming, the glorious, precious hope of Jesus coming back. And now if you've read Galatians, you know that Paul says when Cephas, that's Paul in Aramaic, I mean that's Peter in Aramaic, Cephas is how you say Peter's name in Aramaic, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? But apparently in this, Peter has forgiven Paul, looks up to him, has read his letters, calls them the other scriptures, or includes them in the other scriptures. So making Paul's writings part of the Bible. And he says, only unintelligent or ignorant, unstable people twist his writings to make them say what he wants to their own destruction. So Peter was a simple, blue-collar, working fisherman from Galilee. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees, probably had memorized much of the Old Testament. And yet they've come together. One was reaching the Jews, one was reaching the Gentiles. And Peter says, look at Paul's writings. He says the same thing I'm saying. But some people who are ignorant and unstable distort the Scripture to their own destruction. We see that all around us. If you look at mainline denominations, historical denominations, this is what's happened to most of them. They started taking out the offensive stuff. They started preaching love only. All you need is love. And everybody's welcome. Stay the way you are. We love you just like you are. And you can stay that way. And pretty soon they started shriveling up. And those churches have begun to die. And I know there's some, even today, even in Brazil, who have done the same thing, distorting the scripture to their own destructions. Muslims do this. They say, we have distorted the scripture, and so they don't read it to their own destruction. Jehovah's Witnesses, Brother Joaquin can tell you more about that, have rewritten the New Testament according to their theology, taken things out, changed the words so that it says what they believe instead of the other way around. But my friends, let's come closer to home because I think sometimes I'm ignorant and unstable. And I want the Bible to itch my ears too. And so I don't think about why I'm not making disciples or why I'm not going to all nations or perhaps giving to send someone else. Why I'm not loving someone that I don't like. And I twist the scripture to make it say what I want it to say. May we get down under this book and say, this is my authority. I will think what it says. I will do what it commands. I will live by its teachings under the Holy Spirit's power so that it sanctifies my life. We are, renewed by, we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. Well, it's 12, 17, and we need to get to interpretation. 
How do, we, how do we look at these things? Our motivation is Jesus coming to judge and reward the world. That's our motivation. When you find yourself lagging in the reason for being holy, remember meeting Jesus. He's coming. You will meet him either in fiery judgment or in a hug of friendship. Let that motivate you to be spotless, blameless, and to live at peace with him. Is he your Lord? I pray that everyone that's listening to me, both here and online, have made Jesus the Lord of their lives, have seated him on the throne of their heart so that he's King of kings and Lord of lords. Is he the love of your life? Do you look forward to meeting him or are you dreading it? Make every effort. Don't distort the scripture to say what you want it to say. You still have time. He's patient. Wash your robes in his blood. Sanctify your motives in his spirit. Talk to him every day, even in your temptations through prayer. And you will be spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Hebrews 12, 4 challenges us in your struggle against sin. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. I can tell you I haven't resisted that far. Resist him and he will flee from you. And then finally to finish, 1 Corinthians 13, or 15, the end of 1 Corinthians 15 is this glorious statement from Paul. Listen, I tell you a mystery, Paul says. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the, the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the per perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, make us tireless in the effort to be spotless, blameless, and at peace with You. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son on the cross that pays the debt of our sin and brings peace between us. Help us to stay in that peace. In Jesus' name, amen.